Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vows and More, an online vintage tube store. And today, in tube lab number 22, we're going to look at tubes for the shit Freya Plus preamp, and a whole bunch more. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. And if you're enjoying these videos, please hit the like button and subscribe. Currently, every second email is about the Freya. So I thought, why not answer all the questions in one tube lab? First off, the Freya is a hybrid preamp. What does hybrid mean? Basically, the Freya has two different but interconnected circuit topologies. In this case, tubes and solid state. It also has two different but interconnected tube circuits. The pair of tubes on the right hand side are your left and your right gain stage. And the pair of tubes on the left hand side are your buffer, or more properly called a cathode follower. Now, does that mean you can split your tube choices up into two different matched pairs? Yep, it does. I've been recommending spending the money on the gain tubes, preamp gain tubes, after the original music source and speakers will make the single biggest impact overall in your sound quality. Remember, each of these tubes is an electronic circuit. Now, for the buffer, any matched good quality 6SN7 will work just fine. And that reminds me, one of my customers asked Shit if he could use the much lower rated 6SN7 GT tubes in the Freya Plus. And a prompt answer came straight from the owner himself. Yes, any 6SN7 or close variant can be used in the Freya. Last but not least is what to do about those sunken tubes. Let me show you why that is a big problem if you're planning on rolling vintage tubes. Okay. So here is a standard octal socket. Let's see if we can get the light on it so you can see. There it is. It's got the keyway. Here's the 6SN7. Now I'm going to plug it in sideways, folks. You're going to go in vertically, of course. Don't turn your unit sideways. It wouldn't be easy. And I'm not going to plug it all the way in. This is a brand new socket. You see how stiff it is? It takes about a dozen in and outs before the socket loosens up a bit. You want them snug, because remember, this is an electrical connection, including high voltage. And it, they all have to be connected up properly. Now, once it's in, when you, when you put a tube in, you put it in by grabbing the base and inserting it that way. Straight, straight in, maybe with a tiny rock, straight in. When it comes out, you're going to need to rock the tube. Now, I don't have much lead leverage here because this is not bolted down, but I'm going to pull straight up, not sideways, straight up, and I'm going to rock the tube gently, not a lot, just gently, and I'm going to pull at the same time, out it comes, okay? And it goes straight in, maybe a tiny bit of a rock. Now, let's put this back together again. Why is that a problem with the Freya? Well, with the Freya, you've got your base almost completely buried. How are you going to insert it without holding the glass at the end? You're not. And how are you going to get it out? You're going to get it out by grabbing the glass. Now with vintage tubes with 50, 70 year old glue holding these together, you're going to loosen up your, your bases really fast and you're not going to be happy. Even with a brand new tube, the base glass connection probably will last quite a while, but it's going to loosen up eventually. So this is not good, but there is a solution to the problem. Let's just put that down here. And that's called a socket saver. Now this is a miniature nine pin. This would be for, let's say a 12 AX7. I actually don't have any octal socket savers in the store. I'm bringing in a bunch. I'm going to see if I can find something that I really like quality wise before I carry them. But these, this illustrate what you're getting. Essentially, you get a set of pins, in this case nine pins, but in the octal case, you get 
eight pins. And then you get a set of receivers, just like a socket. But here's the real important thing. You get a lift. And that hopefully will get your base up and above the plate so you can start pulling your tubes out properly and inserting them properly. Yes, aesthetically, it's not going to look so good. If you're going to put in a nice set of tubes and never change them or only change them very occasionally, grab the glass, let the tube cool down, but grab the glass to pull them in or push them out, whatever. You know what I mean. But if you're like me and thousands of other tube fans, you're going to want to roll tubes. The 6SN7 has got a huge collection of tubes available that stretch for decades and decades. It's a wonderful sounding tube and the vintage tubes are just glorious. Many of them anyways. And talking about glorious tubes, enough blah blah blah, let's take a look at tubes. Now in previous tube labs I've talked about the 6SN7s in detail, many of these. So I'm going to put a link below for you, and you can watch them if you want. We're just going to do a really quick run through. So remember I said that a good solid 6SN7 in the buffer would be a great idea? Well, here we have one. This is the short bottle G. I know they're not sexy tubes. The GTA and the GTB are virtually the same tube. The GTA is a little older. They have slightly different heater warm-up specifications, but that really doesn't affect you. They have a really nice forward base, and in fact, overall, they're a nice sounding tube, and you could put them in the gain side. But what they do have, I mean, if you're a base thumper, these might be your tubes. But what they do have is great solid construction. Now, I, I test thousands of tubes in a year, and I throw out thousands of tubes in a year. And when I get one of these short bottle GEs in to test, they're almost always good. And that tells me that this is a well-made tube and a very long-lived tube. If you were to find a fairly, um, a fairly close to new old stock or new old stock, this is very close to new old stock, this one here. It's testing nice and high. In fact, let's talk about that. This is my GM number. And GM is essentially the potential gain of a tube. Now, why is that important? Well, if you've got two gain stages, remember these are twin triodes, two identical tubes inside one envelope. So we've got two circuits inside this tube. We want to have these fairly closely matched. And remember, this is one channel. The next tube is another channel. We're going to want those numbers inside of 5% is good. We'd call that a match. Inside of 1% is perfect. And for older tubes, and we'll look at some in a minute, inside of 10% is perfectly acceptable. Now you can cheat these numbers. You could have a tube at 87% and at 77%, which sounds like it's quite a bit off. But if your other tube had exactly the same arrangement of numbers or, or potential gain, then that would work perfectly in the circuit because every side of the tube would be matched with each other. Okay, enough with the G's. Next, we've got a very affordable Russian equivalent. This one was made in 1976. It's an elevated gray T-plate. It was made by a company called NEVZ, and that stands for Novosibirsk Electro Vacuum Plant in Soyuz, Russia. There, yeah, I hope I got that right. Pardon the accent, I just can't resist. The Russians made some really good solid tubes. I'm not going to name the country that doesn't make very good solid tubes, but you know, the Russians. Um, they went. They their tube era lasted a lot longer than Western countries. They just kept. They had a lot of demand for military, and they just kept on making tubes. Um, in fact, they never really stopped. Unlike many plants in the West that just shut down and never reopened. This is 
a good, solid, very inexpensive 6SN7. It's, it would be fun to roll it in. And remember those elevated plates. We're going to get back to that theme as we go along. Now this is a mil-spec tube. It's made by MELZ, that's Moscow Electric Light Company. You know it's mil-spec right off the bat. It's got a metal base. Nobody with a home radio needed a metal base. This is for military use. That goes the world over. You see a metal base, you know it's a military tube. This is also a direct equivalent to the 6SN7. It's also got ele elevated black T plates. This version has two holes. Those are rivets, so two rivets. It's got waste chrome, and it's got, because the waste chrome's there, you know the getter's down at the bottom. Now, the tube that predated this MELZ is one of the most unobtainium 6SN7s in the world. I've never actually heard them. People say it's the best sounding version ever made. And the way to tell they look very much like this. The way to tell them apart is that it looks like the plates have the barrel of a machine gun. Yep. It's got a whole series of little round holes. Instead of those rectangles, those rectangular rivets, it's got a whole series of little circular rivets. Now, there, I haven't been able to get my hands on a pair, and I've been trying for a long time. I'd love to bring them into Tube Lab and compare them to some of the other really great 6SN7s. What's important to note is this is the next generation after the really expensive version, and these sound terrific. And that is often the case with the tube company. Sure, they change some of the plate construction. Sure, they sound perhaps a bit different, but you get you'll get a lot of the high quality sound of the earlier version in the next version. These are from 1954, so they're seriously vintage. They're terrific sounding tubes. They're not cheap, but they're certainly not unobtainium. Okay. Up next, we've got something that I haven't reviewed yet. It's a tube I do recommend to customers when they ask me for something different and special in a 6SN7. These are made by Marconi. Now Marconi goes way back to the very beginnings of the invention. Marconi himself um, was an inventor. So the invention of the radio and he also headed one of the first large electronics plants and companies in the world. Eventually Marconi uh, joined forces with Osram. They became Marconi Osram and they held many of the original patent designs for tube types. In Canada, they had a, one of the largest tube plants in the world was in Montreal. My father, who grew up in Montreal, said the plant went four large city blocks in each direction. Now, they would have made radios, they would have made tubes, they would have made specialized military equipment. Who knows what they were making in that plant? I'm pretty sure that one of the very first patents for the 6SN probably goes back to Marconi, but I've never been able to find that history. The Canadian history of tubes is not that well documented that I'm aware of. Somebody's probably going to pipe up and say, there's a fabulous book on the subject. Well, put it in the comments section because I'd love to read it. Now, these tubes show up fairly rarely even in Canada under all different kinds of brand names. Westinghouse will have it be be rebranded on here. GE will be rebranded. Even RCA will be. Those are not the companies that built this. Marconi had that huge manufacturing facility. They would rebrand the tube for GE so that they could sell in their own uh, dealers a GE branded tube. So what are the distinguishing features? A very elevated set of black T plates. I believe this design is what the Russians copied into their own designs. And in fact, I think almost everybody copied this design. It's got a large D getter with a bar across it. You can see it way down at the bottom there. That's the arm that supports it. And of course, that means it's got waste chrome. Now, because I haven't reviewed these before, I'll talk in brief about them. These tubes have something very special going up in the high end. A lot of air. What What is air? Air is... It could be distortion, or it could be a presentation of the room environment itself in the high frequencies. Either way, it really helps the music have a live 
sense of presentation, which is important to many people, especially jazz lovers, but probably every bit of music out there would benefit from that. Overall, they really are just they're uni a very unique sounding too, with that very high-end presentation. They do everything well, they're a great sounding tube, they're not terribly expensive, and luckily I found a whole pile of these things. A lot of them are dead, unfortunately, but the store is going to have some good inventory. If you want to try them out, um, they're well worth it. I'd highly recommend them. Up next, we've got the Sylvania Bad Boy. Look at how similar that is to the earlier Marconi. It's got large waist chrome, elevated black T-plates, either two or three rivets on each side. Now, be careful with these plate, with these tubes. They're fairly expensive, and a lot of people online are calling anything and everything a bad boy. Not even tubes made by Sylvania they're calling bad boys. The identifying features are date codes from about 1940 to about 1962 or 3. You've got, of course, the elevated black T-plate. You've got a large amount of waste chrome. That's a very distinguishing feature. And way at the bottom, you won't be able to see it, is the foil getter. And what that is, is a piece of rectangular silver material with the gettering on it. And you'll be able to see it up close if you just turn it slightly like that. That is a distinguishing feature of the Sylvania Bad Boy. And of course, you'll often have a Sylvania label, and you'll also have a rebrand, because Sylvania made tubes for a lot of other companies that just sold them, just like Marconi. Okay, now these are wonderful sounding tubes. In particular, the bass is very detailed. So for bass thumpers, you don't really care about that, but for jazz aficionados, uh, people who love small ensemble classical, that articulate detailed bass, the sound of a string of an upright bass being plucked is glorious when you can hear it properly, undistorted by the tube, the system, the speakers. And of course, if it doesn't get to your speakers intact, it's gone. So the preamp tubes are critical for that. This is just a wonderful sounding tube. The problem with these tubes is that they're now going on 70 years old all the bases pretty much separate from the glass. They need, they need repairs, so there'll be a little bit of a glue repair on each side. I do them neatly, but you'll still see it. There, this is virtually new old stock, if not new old stock. It's testing very high. This is a rare uh, bad boy. Most of them look pretty beat up. They still sound great. The problem is they, they're not going to be long-lived and there's, it's getting really hard to find matched pairs of these things. So, if you don't mind putting out some serious money and not having the tube with you forever, then go for it. What I do with very expensive tubes is I plug them in for special listening sessions. Let's say over the Christmas holidays, I'll plug them in for a couple of weeks. And then I put them away and retire them. That way you'll have the tubes for years and years if you store them carefully. It's just an option. Okay, up next, we got two generations later, the 6SN7 GTB by Sylvania. Now that it's got the same black T-plates, in this case it's got five rivets, but they're angled. And this is the standard pattern for many of the later 6SN7 tubes made by many manufacturers. We'll look at another one in a minute. This is just a lovely sounding tube all around. They're fairly common. They're not cheap, but they're not expensive. So they're affordable. They're quite long lived. I Because I specialize in the 6SN7 and I particularly specialize in Sylvania tubes, I have a lot in stock, so matching them up is fairly easy. If you were to say to me, Jim, what's the one vintage tube I could buy and not be disappointed in that I will love? it would be this particular tube. Okay, up next is a very similar tube made by Tungsol. It sounds very much like the Sylvania. The plate structure and the alignment is all very similar. It's a little different. And it's really hard to describe the difference. 
A lot of people like the tongue saws. This is a new old stock version. They're a little bit more expensive. Tongue saw didn't make, they were a smaller manufacturer than Sylvania and GE and RCA. And tongue saw didn't make nearly as many tubes. They made wonderful, good quality tubes. They sound terrific. This is no exception. This would be a very good choice. It's a little different than the Sylvania presentation. The only way to find out what you like is to roll them and try them. Okay, here's a little hint if you want to have some fun. In my store I have a section called All Discount Tubes. This is a Photon. It's another Russian equivalent. It's a nice tube. The base is a little beat up. It's actually a new old stock tube. It's testing very high. If you want to have fun, go to the discount tube section and buy a pair or four or six octal tubes. They're only $10 a piece. I'll get you decent quality matched tubes if that's what you want. If you put in an order for two, you get a matched pair or a fairly closely matched pair. And they're just tubes that haven't caught the fancy of anybody. They may sound wonderful to you and $20 for a pair it, they'll be a steal and some of these might end up in your in your shipment and I might I might go through a bin a huge bin of Sylvania 6SN7 GTBs which I just did for a customer and I found a couple of tubes in which the sides were different but matched with each other so they're perfectly acceptable they're fairly expensive tubes as a pair but he got a pair for 20 bucks so that can happen it just depends on what I've got in stock that day. Sometimes you'll get really lucky. Okay, here's an example of something interesting. Here's a Raytheon, another short bottle like the GE, big black plates. And I've only had a few of these in, but on the weekend I bought a large collection of tubes, a couple of thousand tubes, and a whole bunch of these popped out. And I thought, well, let's clean a pair up and try them. They sound really nice. They're not going to be an expensive tube. They're not very sexy looking, but, you know, they're well worth a try. I was surprised Raytheon is famous for making wonderful sounding tubes. Uh, you know, maybe we'd like it to be a little more sexy, but it really, in the end, it's about the sound, folks. The sex part, mm, you know, you can take it or leave it. I like nice looking stuff, but I think I would, if this was the best sounding 6SN7, it's not, but it's a very good sounding one, I would go for it whether it was sexy or not. Okay, now if you don't want to buy vintage and all you want to do is a recommendation for a brand new tube that looks good and sounds great, this would be my recommendation. This is the Northern Electric 6SN7. It's a reproduction that's not a reproduction. It's basically um, paying tribute to a nice looking vintage tube that never existed. If you look at an original Northern Electric 6SN7, and it's hard to find a picture online, but I eventually found one. It looks nothing like this tube. It's just very nice brass base and ceramic gold-plated pins, which is a waste of time. That just wears off, but it looks pretty. But the main thing is these tubes sound really good. Now, they're very expensive. They're an exclusive product of, I believe, the Tube Depot. But if all you wanted to do was buy a really nice pair of gain tubes and you didn't want to fool around with vintage tubes, this would be a good choice. Okay, that was fun. Now, let's take a look at some tubes that came in. Here's a 6550. Let's see if you can see that number. There it is. This is um, a variant of the KT88. These are G's. People really like these. These are used. I've got, I think I've got a used quad, matched quad. I have to test them. You can see the little burn marks on each side tell you right away that this thing has been fired up. It's supposed to test high though and matched. And this is a vintage GE 6550s are a much loved power tube. What else came in? Oh, we've got some Svetlana Flying Seas. Let's see if we can get this out of the box for you. Now there's Svetlana reissue tubes and then there's the original. The original stopped production in about 2000. The 
the rear shoe is a completely different tube. It's, they've attempted to make it look a lot like the, this tube, and it may well be a good sounding tube, but it's not the same tube. Now, you're going to say, where's that Flying C logo? I wish I'd brought one out for you to show you. It's got a stylized C with wings on each side. This looks like the logo of the, of the reissue. Well, that stylized S for Svetlana Electric Devices, it's a Russian company, that was actually the logo that they used for much of their production. Now, the Flying C came along, and they either sold or lost the rights of that logo to a New York-based company, New Sensor, which is actually one of the largest two companies in the world today. They they own the Electro Harmonix brand, and they have a whole bunch of uh, reissued brands that they, they use as well. So the date code on here is 9639, so the 39th week of 1996. Now the way to tell these apart from the reissue is that the original has these little spacer wires coming off of the plates, sorry, off the micas, and it's going to have a dimple on top. I think the reissue has a dimple, but the base is a giveaway. See how the base looks like sort of inexpensive, cheap plastic that's colored with age? This is, a, even though it's a used tube, it's very much a brand new tube. It's You can't see any burn marks on it or anything, and it's testing very high. The base of the reissue looks like a very light milk chocolatey brown. Again, it was meant to look like this tube, but it, they, none of them ever get to this sort of aged look. So that's the dead giveaway. And of course, the date code. What else came in? Oh, here's another EL34. This is a very special one. Now, this was for North American market, so it's actually using the 6CA7. We don't use that really anymore. Pretty much everybody calls it the EL34 now. What is this? Well, it's branded Phillips, which is a fabulous company. But the dead giveaway is etched on this tube. Is, let's see if you can see it. Great Britain, can you see that across there? That is always a red alert. It might be a mullard. Now, how do we know if it's a mullard for sure? Well, Remember, Mullard was a subsidiary of Phillips. Both of them terrific um, tube manufacturers. See the two narrow slots? Okay, well, that's a really good hint. We've got a real Mullard. But the date, the etched manufacturing code down here is, is the piece de resistance. We've got a large B. That means Blackburn Mullard. This is a Mullard EL34, and a whole bunch of them came in. Now, I haven't tested them yet, so I could have a bunch of dead tubes. These are worth a small fortune. They're very expensive tubes. Hopefully I have at least a couple of matched quads. Those will be going to the store maybe over the weekend. Okay, now we're going to have to back up, folks. Hold, stay with me. Wait till you see what's coming. Okay. This is huge. Look at the size of that box. It's, it's, it's the size of all the tubes combined. Now, the box is falling apart, but with antique vintage boxes, you don't throw them away. You keep these things. Now, I'll probably do a little discreet repair on the lid. Look what's inside of this thing, though. See how it's nestled there in sort of a fabric? This is a serious tube. U.S. Army, U.S. Navy, Jan, so Joint Army, Navy, 211. Ooh, yeah. Anybody who's been watching me knows that I've been getting into direct heated triodes. Look at the size of that power tube. And it's got a unique base. I don't even have any sockets in for it yet. It's got, it's, so a direct heated triode, will, it's gonna have four pins, and it goes into a metal receiver. So it slides down, and this would go in, twist, and lock. And of course, it's a mil-spec tube. It's a very heavy duty tube. A lot of people who are into direct heated triodes love this as a single-ended power tube and it's probably a tube that you would only want to play in the winter time in the northern hemisphere because these things are going to get hot folks okay one more box and it's even bigger we're going to have to back up even further and <laughs> check this out <laughs> fragile glass yeah no kidding 
Look at the rat's nest in there. I almost expected a critter to come jumping out at me. Okay, let's see if I can get it open on camera for you. This is the first time it's seen the light of day maybe in 50 years. Look at that. That's a 311. Uh, I believe the 311 and the 211 are in the same family. They're, they're drop-in replacements for each other. This is made, look at the gorgeous logo on the metal. This is made in the U.S. by United Electronic Company. And that's just another beautiful direct heated triode. Okay, enough with the toys. If you stay till the end, here are some discount codes. Get that on camera straight. Now, I have free shipping on orders over $150 after discount and flat rate $20 shipping around the world. Okay, stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Vows and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.